You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 201, Hebrews Q&A, part one. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you? Pretty good. Good week. I think we're going to have a good uh, Q&A. I was yeah, able to we you know, obviously look at these ahead of time. And lots of questions, and we apologize that we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but we certainly picked <laughs> most of them. But uh, just know, yeah. you know, we did get your questions and we can't answer everybody's questions, but uh, yeah. because uh, some of them are thesis topics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, we've got some good ones for you. So, uh, yeah, depending upon the length here, we may break it up into two episodes, but uh, I guess we'll find out as time goes here, Mike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they are good. You know, I had a chance to, to look at them, you know, with and uh you know, Trey sent sent me a list, and then we we picked what we thought we could do in an hour. So that might be wishful thinking because uh, they're all good questions. A, a number of them are are either kind of involved or I think require some extended discussion and illustration. So you know that that's that's why we're we're talking about this episode already the way we are in terms of time. But Trey, I, I guess we can just jump right into yeah, it. And we also know once you get going, it's hard to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's hard to pull you back. So Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's just get it. Um Chad has our first question and his question is uh he was wondering if Mike could expound a little bit on the implications that are projected by Hebrews 10 verse 14, quote, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Yeah, the what the the emphasis on a little bit. Well, that's going to fly right out the window. <laughs> um, you know, where do I want to jump in here? Um, I think that it's it's really helpful in, in something like this. Why, why don't we just read the the actual verse so people you know kind of get the context for the specifics of the question? The, the verse says this is Hebrews ten fourteen, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So you have this element of something that's already happened, but then you have this ongoing, you know, sort of thing. And ultimately the 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 question revolves around the the relationship of what Jesus did and our life, you know, our works, so to speak. And and you know how how does all that fit into this? You know, the and I think we really need to distinguish, not just for the sake of this question, but you know, some of the other questions, and just generally, uh, in in the wake of the Hebrews up, uh, series, we just have to distinguish the scriptural concept of discipleship, i.e., sanctification, from merit-based thinking. If you're able to do that, trust me, it's going to be a, a, a boon to your Christian life. So, obviously, Scripture talks a lot about discipleship, a lot about holy living. It, it obviously talks about something, you know, your sanctification being accomplished already. So we have these two things. And and I think where, you know, things get muddled is when we start, you know, thinking about uh, works as though they have something to do with merit. And again, this is a one string banjo for me. You've heard this many times. I have a whole sermon, you know, on, on, on the internet about it called Why We Were Yet Sinners, where I talk about this. And for the sake of our discussion here, we have to be able to distinguish the concept of discipleship from merit-based thinking, you know, earning eternal life. Those are two different things. And, you know, we, we need to stop thinking about works in terms of earning God's love and earning God's favor. God loved us while we were yet sinners, before we, we cared a whit about being a disciple or living holy. What we do behaviorally doesn't spark or stimulate love in the heart of God for us. That's already there. It's, it's been there from the get-go. So I think we need to you know, just sort of get these kind of things fixed in our head. In, in the case of Hebrews 10, 14, and really any other passage that uses the, a word like sanctify, you know, to, to make holy, we have to realize that you know, sanctify can mean different things, and it really depends on who's doing what. Now, 
What's really interesting here is that if you have software, if you have some other means of doing this, you can. If you actually look up the verb that's, that's used here in Hebrews 10, you know, 14, we have the, the, the verb hagiadzo, to make holy, to make sacred, to sanctify, okay? It's used 28 times in the active voice. That means the subject is doing the action. That, that occurs 11 times, and it occurs 17 times in the passive voice. This is where someone is being sanctified by some external agent. Interestingly enough, in the active voice, the passages that use the active voice for hagiadzo, to sanctify, they never describe believers sanctifying themselves by their works. Never. Okay, and I'm going to actually take the time to read those to you. All those verses, these are the 11 instances where hagiadzo, this verb in Hebrews 10, 14, occurs in the active voice. You know, different tenses, but active voice. So we have Matthew 23, 17. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? So there the temple is, you know, sanctifying the gold. John 10, 36. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated, whom the Father sanctified? Hagiadzo and sent into the world, you are blaspheming. So the subject there isn't, you know, believers. John 17, 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So he's asking God to sanctify us, okay? His disciples. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify her. Who's the he? Well, you know, God, Jesus, he might sanctify her, okay, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water by the word. So okay, God is the active agent. Hebrews 13, 12, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Okay, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So here, believers are told to honor Christ as holy, to sanctify Jesus in their hearts. Doesn't say anything about working, you know, behaving a certain way so that God, you know, feels affectionate or feels love for us. Back to the Gospels. This is, I'm just going through a, a spreadsheet here of uh, the different tenses. These are all active voice. Matthew 23, 19. So back to the Gospels. You blind men, for which is greater the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Near the Gospel, it was the temple. Here it's the altar that sanctifies. John 17, 19. For their sake, I consecrate, I sanctify myself. And this is Jesus praying that they also may be sanctified in truth or by truth. Hebrews 2.11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. In the active one, he who sanctifies, again, that's not believers. We don't sanctify ourselves through our works. It's somebody you know, else doing, you know, the, playing the active role, and we are the passive recipient. Hebrews 9.13, for if the blood of bulls and goats, the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, uh, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, so on and so forth. You know, so here he's talking about the the blood of bulls and goats sanctifying, you know, someone or something. Of course, and then he says, well, it, it doesn't do that. So those are all eleven occurrences of hagiadzo in the active voice. The passages never describe believers sanctifying themselves, making themselves holy, solidifying their standing before God as you know set apart individuals by their works. It never happens. Passive voice 17 times. This is where believers are sanctified by an external agent. Again, I, you, you caught the drift in some of those verses I already read because the passive, verse occur, or passive uh, voice occurs in the same context as an active voice. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of those because, again, the, the passive voice is some external agent or force, i.e. God or Jesus or the sacrifice of Jesus, sanctifies us. We don't have it's not our job. We don't have a role in it. Now, this takes us to the question of what makes us sanctified and what does that mean? We often think of this term as though it is the result of spiritual disciplines, but that isn't the way it's presented in the New Testament. We are set apart, made holy in the sense, just like the Old Testament, of being made a possession of God. I mean, think of the temple. You had objects that were sanctified because they were used on sacred space exclusively. You had people who were sanctified, priests who occupied sacred space, you know, specifically, you know, God, you know, set them aside. This setting apart idea, okay, that's the way that, that, that we are talked about as believers. We are set apart by God. We are made a possession of God by something God does or something Christ did. 
nothing we do, again, think of the active voice, nothing we do achieves that status. That's why sanctification is presented the way it is. However, you know, Scripture's pretty clear about holy living and discipleship. It's just that other words and descriptions are used for those concepts. Now, we don't achieve the status of being God's children or his possession by our works. We are to live holy because we are God's possession, because we are God's children. And we are to be holy and live holy in light of what God has done, what Christ has done, not to obtain it. We are to be pure vessels so as to be of use by our owner, not to convince him to own us. Okay, he didn't need convincing. Okay, he, God loved us while we were yet sinners. Our performance wasn't the issue, and it's not the issue now in terms of being sanctified. Now, I realize this runs contrary to the way a lot of this is preached, and, you know, I can't help that. But like I said, you can, you can run the search for yourself and see how Hagiadzo is used, and you're going to find just what I read to you. And I, I don't need to, to make it up because it's just there. So let's try not to think about how the way these things are preached to us, and let's try to think about what the text actually says. So the text affirms two things. It's God who sanctifies us, but yet we are supposed to live holy. We're supposed to be disciples, followers of Christ. And a lot of the questions uh, you know, are sort of tracked along this trajectory. So we're going to be returning to these themes and other questions, but we'll just keep going here a little bit more with, with Hebrews 10, 14. So if we go back to the verse, you know, I think we should read it in light of uh, verse 10. Okay, we've actually got two, you know, passages here, two, two verses to sort of consider and be mindful of. We've got Hebrews 10, 14 and, you know, Hebrews 10, 10. So let me just turn there real quickly. So we have here in verse 10, and by that will, you know, this, this will, Jesus, this inter-Trinitarian inter conversation, I have come to do your will, okay, where the, the Son says to the Father in verse 9, I have come to do your will, verse 10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. It doesn't need to be supplemented. It's not going to run out. It's not going to become obsolescent. Okay, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Then we get down to verse 14. For by a single offering, well, that's the offering back there in verse 10, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, what, what we have here, again, we have this, this statement of something that has occurred, and then we have, you know, and it really it even occurred for all time. It has eternal ramifications. And then we have this being sanctified kind of language. So, what we have here is we have by a single offering, Jesus has perfected. He's, he's brought this into being. It's complete. He has completed for all time this status, our status before God. The being sanctified idea describes the ongoing result. The result of what Jesus did through this one offering, this once for all, for all time offering, the result of that is still in process. Okay? It's still effective. It's still good. Okay? It didn't run out. The result of it is still in process. Put another way, Christ's offering set us apart to God, and that set apartness is still in effect. It's ongoing. It will remain to the end if we keep believing. Now, there are other passages in Hebrews that get into this, and I think, again, this is really, this is an important passage. If you want to refer to sort of a theme passage in the Hebrews for all the stuff we've been talking about, we talked about in the series and what we're talking about now. It's Hebrews 3. Okay, here's verse 12 through 14. Take care, brothers. Okay, he addresses them as brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Oh, he's talking to brothers about the danger of having an unbelieving heart. We don't want, we don't want that to happen. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an, un, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Well, what's the deceitfulness of sin? Well, it's what he just was worried about, the evil, unbelieving heart. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed, if indeed, we share in Christ, if indeed, we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Now, what's really interesting here, and we didn't, you know, we don't have time to mention everything when we do these episodes, 
on, on book studies. But the phrase deceitfulness of sin, sin there, the noun has the definite article in front of it. You could make an exegetical point here that this is what Wallace and other grammarians call the dictic, the pointing article. It has demonstrative force. In other words, we don't want any of you to be hardened by the deceitfulness of this sin or that sin, referring back to the problem of the evil, unbelieving heart. So you can make an exegetical point to reinforce the idea that this is what he's concerned about. He's talking to believers about not falling into unbelief. That's what freaks him out. It's the only thing that will impede the natural progression of us being set apart by what Jesus did. Okay, what, what Jesus did is still in effect. It's going to see us through to the end. We will have eternal life. We will, be, we will be a member of God's family. We will be part of the household of God if we believe. That's it. It has nothing to do with performance. We don't sanctify ourselves. We're already sanctified, but we just need to keep believing. And then, you know, again, discipleship is, is an issue that's covered in lots of different passages. It just doesn't use this sort of vocabulary. So Hebrews 10, 14, Hebrews 10, 10, and, you know, verse 14 have nothing to do with our own effort. Our growth as disciples is the subject of other passages, not this one. And in any event, we seek to grow, we seek to be holy for many reasons. Earning God's favor, earning the status of being God's child or his possession is not one of those reasons. So it, honestly, it seems like we need a whole episode on this, but we'll, let's just transition to another question since we'll, we'll kind of pick up with this, this theme again. All right. Justin has four really good questions here. So the first one is, in Hebrews 3, verse 18 through 19, isn't unbelief equated to being disobedient? The disobedience would have been to the Torah, the only word they had. So couldn't we say that that being disobedient to the parts of Torah we can keep today would be unbelief in the Word? So on the one hand, we just read Hebrews 3. And yeah, the, 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 the disobedience, the, the thing that the sin that he's worried about there is an unbelieving heart. But that is not the same as, oh, I could have kept you know, the Feast of, of Tabernacles today. I could observe that on the calendar. And so that's like the same as the sin of unbelief. No, not so much. Again, you can't extrapolate a, a specific episode that the writer of Hebrews is drawing on, that he's really worried about people just giving up the faith to, oh, and I'm not really going to you know, do the Sabbath. I'm not really going to do this, this point of Torah, you know, that kind of thing. You know, deciding to not believe is, is different than either you know, saying, well, I don't really think this pertains today, so I'm not going to keep this festival. Or, you know, some other, you know, point of Torah that you might do either accidentally. Or let's just say that you, you know, you, I don't know, you, you steal something or whatever. Okay. You could still believe, but you were weak or you were stubborn. You were hard hearted, whatever. You know, the, the context, let, let's just say it this way. Let's approach it this way. The context refers back to the sin of unbelief. That's kind of obvious. The specific episode makes disobedience noted here, you know, unbelief. Okay. It's illegitimate to say that any disobedience is the same sin of unbelief. How do we know that? Because you can disobey out of rebellion. You can disobey out of self-interest as a believer. If every disobedience was unbelief, now think about this, if every disobedience was unbelief, then you couldn't have believers sin. Because by definition, every sin would be evidence that they're not believing. I mean, it implodes on itself. Every sin would be evidence that it, it would be an act of disavowing belief in the gospel. Well, that, you know, honestly, that's just not coherent. By definition, that would make you an unbeliever. So if every sin is the same as the sin of unbelief, then I don't, I don't guess we don't have any believers in the world because everybody sins. And John, you know, says quite clearly, 1 John 1, 10, that if we say we don't sin, we make God a liar. So it, it just doesn't, it's not coherent. It implodes on itself. Now, let, let's look at some examples. When Moses disobeyed God, he gets angry and he hits the rock. Did that make him an unbeliever? Was he now an unbeliever? You know, what didn't he believe? You know, I mean, what, you know, where did he throw his believing loyalty to? You know, he sinned because he was angry. Maybe he had too much self-confidence. You know, before when he was called, you know, the problem was he didn't have any confidence. He was faithless. And now maybe he just has a big head. He still believes that God is the, you know, Yahweh is the God of gods. That hasn't changed. Okay, when people violate Torah, are they treated as Gentiles in the Old Testament? Is, are they looked at as unbelievers? 
you know, if, if they violate anything, you know, like some ritual impurity or, or some moral impurity, uh, they're, the reason that they're, they're punished is because they're part of the community. They're not all just exiled or the community doesn't just evaporate because everyone sins. Every sin is not the same as the sin of unbelief because then by definition, you wouldn't have a believing community at any given point of time. You know, you, you, you just wouldn't have it. When David commits adultery, did he stop believing in Yahweh? I mean, you look at David, you know, the whole situation, his prayer, it's obvious that he didn't. He still believed in Yahweh, but he knew he had done terrible things. Since no Old Testament person was sinless, were they all unbelievers? I mean, you, you, you kind of see where the, where this is going. It, it, it's just, it's not logically coherent. It's not theologically coherent either to make that specific equation. Now, I would say, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to say this not because of, of the question or the questioner. I'm going to make this broad because I, I have heard this kind of thing come over the pulpit. So I'm going to shoot at, at a pulpit in my past. This sort of mindset leaves no room for being human. It disallows human frailty, of which God is quite aware. Uh, in other words, it implicitly requires perfection for fellowship with God. And honestly, that's dangerous. That's just dangerous. And I would say unbiblical, both by precept and by example. You know, the lives of people that you read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament, for that matter. This sort of extrapolation, uh, again, it, 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 the kind of extrapolation that we have implied in this approach, this idea, again, it, it's just dangerous. You know, again, I've just heard this thing in, in my own past, and so I'm, I'm taking a few moments to shoot at it a little bit. It's a way of saying, behave a certain way, or maybe you're not saved, or you'll lose salvation, or or you, you're you're your conduct, your, your, your life, you know, your works. You have to do a certain thing. You got to measure up to a certain standard of behavior or else you're out. You're not a believer. Again, every sin equated with the sin of unbelief, it's just really, really dangerous. After all, if you ever sin, then you're just like an unbeliever. That's what you are. Again, I have heard this from the pulpit. And it, again, it is unscriptural by precept and by example. And it's just something that I know is common. Again, I'm not here to, to, to beat up on my own context because I still believe that my own original context as a believer had far more benefits than liabilities to me personally. But I, again, I just know really good people that were disciples. They wanted to follow the Lord, and this just crushed their spirit. It crushed them because as soon as it entered into their minds that, well, anything I do is the same as the sin of unbelief, and I'm just, I'm lost. And I'm always going to be lost because I'm always going to sin. I can't be perfect. That is crushing. And it, honestly, it's a different gospel. So you know, we, we can go on to another, another question. All right. Justin also wants to know in Hebrews 9.14, what is the meaning of purify our conscience from dead <laughs> works? Yeah, we, we touched on this in whatever episode it was when we were in Hebrews 9. It, it means stop trusting in dead works that can't save. Uh, the contrast to the dead works in the actual passage is seen in the preceding verses. You know, Christ secured an eternal salvation. And also in the following verse, uh, Hebrews 9.15, I'll, I'll read that verse here. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So, you know, if the first covenant couldn't save you, the first covenant again, centered on all these rituals and all these rules and whatever. Well, the good news is that there's a different covenant in operation now, and something was done for you. you know, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, and a death has occurred. That would be Jesus' death. And so that is what you should be trusting. And you know, don't let your conscience be, be troubled by believing that the first covenant, again, this system of, of all these rules and, and, and stuff, that doesn't save you. So purify your conscience from dead works. Don't get tangled up. Don't get enmeshed. Don't get spiritually strangled by all this work stuff. It couldn't accomplish salvation in the first place. Okay. So now we have something that does accomplish salvation. God, you know, Christ did something that sets us apart to God, puts us in the family of God, and that's what we need to be believing in. That's what we need to be trusting. Okay. What is your opinion on what Hebrews 4, 9 means by, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, whenever we were in Hebrews 4, uh, we, we spent you know, some time on this too. But I'm going to go back and, and read. Uh, let's read just verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. What, what this means is it means that the rest that Israel obtained under Joshua, i.e. the inheritance of the, the promised land, that was temporary. There remains a different, better rest now for the people of God, because if, if that land had, if, if, if Joshua had given them rest, God wouldn't have talked about another one to come. We are to strive to enter that rest. Does that mean work so hard that God accepts us? No. The second half of the verse tells us what it means, that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What was the disobedience? This is verse 11. You know, what was the disobedience? We're supposed to strive, Hebrews 4.11, to enter into that rest that remains. Okay, do, do we have to work so hard that God accepts us? No. The, uh, the objective is to not fall by the same sort of disobedience. And what was the disobedience that was hearkened to back in chapter 3, here in chapter 4 again? It was unbelief. It was unbelief. The disobedience that kept Israel from their rest was unbelief. That's earlier in chapter 4. Again, we can go, you just go back and, and look at that. So. The striving to enter the enter the rest, the new rest that's offered, you know, through Jesus, is to believe it and keep believing. Therefore, we will, if we do that, you know, we'll enter into God's rest. And by analogy, God stopped working. Okay, when when He rested, works were over. When we enter into rest, you know, the rest that God has provided for us, works are not an issue. It's been accomplished for us. So you know, we have the analogy of of the the whole ceasing from work to enter into rest idea. Okay, Justin's last question is, salvation is a gift. Do you believe that works done on earth determine a level of reward or responsibility in the kingdom? Yeah, I do. I think that works have nothing to do with kingdom residence, okay, salvation. But scripture does suggest rewards in the kingdom, you know, are not all the same. I mean, not everybody has the same reward, that kind of thing. You know, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15, I think, suggests this. I'll just read the passage. Uh, Paul says, uh, beginning in verse 10, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, and the foundation is salvation, that's Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So. The works here are not the foundation. The works are what goes on top of the foundation. The works do not replace or displace salvation through Christ. That's very clear in this passage. The works are, you know, something, again, put upon top, you know, in addition to, you know, this, this status that was gained for us by what someone else did, namely Jesus. So the, the real question here, is it an all or nothing idea? You know, like, like are, are we going to get to a... Some people will take this, and again, I've heard this preached too, that, you know, like if you're not, they wouldn't say it this way, but basically, if you're not like nearly perfect, or as at least as perfect as I am, the preacher, you know, if you don't have a, a life of, you know, this this endless string of victories here, spiritual victories, or, you know, then you're going to get to heaven. If, if you don't have more spiritual victories than not, then everything's going to burn up, you know, in flames before your eyes, and you'll go, you'll be with the Lord empty-handed. I think that's bunk, okay? It's not an all or nothing idea. It's very doubtful. And I think, I doubt that it's a total loss because what that implies is that on the other side, you have a total success. There are no total successes in discipleship. Why? Because we're people, we're humans, we're fallible. We aren't deities. Okay, we're not God. You know, we're, we're not, by definition, we are imperfect. So if you're going to say that, that having failures, spiritual failures and struggles with sin, sometimes you lose. You know, you might even lose a lot. It might be a huge struggle, okay? That that wipes everything out. I just don't see the coherence of that because then, you know, you're, you're, you're taking an equally, you're, you're taking an, an imperfect scorecard 
you know, let, let's say you have more victories than failures, your scorecard is still imperfect. And so, so God, you know, like gives you everything. It's, it's like a total success. And then, you know, if, if the scales tip the other way, it's a total loss. I don't think that's the picture at all. What I think is going on here, uh, I should just go to a quick, quick reference in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I think this this verse needs to be part of preceding chapter, you know, at least consideration uh, in tandem with 1 Corinthians 3. I think what the point is that everyone is going to suffer some loss and everyone is going to get some reward. But but the, the tallies, as it were, you know, what, what that amounts to, uh, I don't see any evidence in Scripture where it's equal for everybody. I think we're all just going to see, you know, how we could have been used, you know, where we fell short, where we rebelled, where we stumbled, where we just... We just failed. And we'll see, again, what, what might have been, what God could have done with us in, in a given circumstance. And we'll suffer loss, but we'll also see what God was able to accomplish with us when we presented ourselves as a, as a, a useful tool. You know, and, that, and that's one of the motivations for holy living, to be useful. You know, it, it has nothing to do with earning a place in God's family, meriting it enough. It has everything to do, though, with being useful. God God wants to use people. He wants to use believers to help other people become believers, to help believers grow, to do things for the kingdom. You have to make yourself useful. And basically, if you're just not a disciple of Jesus, if you're if you're not trying to 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 live, you know, with him as your model, you're going to become pretty pretty darn well useless, at least useless in certain contexts. You know that that's the whole. You know that that's really where the rubber meets the road as far as the debate. You know, do do we have Christians that are like like one percent useful and ninety nine percent useless? Again, ultimately, you know, I I, I don't I don't know. You know. The Spirit of God takes up residence in, in someone and encourages them. You know, to you know prompts them to do certain things. You know, do they believe or not believe? Well, ultimately, I don't have the answer for that. Only the person knows that, and only God knows that. You know, at the end of the day, all I know is that we have to believe to have eternal life, and we need to be grateful. We we should want to be useful. We need to be grateful for our salvation, and you know, live accordingly. I mean, th- those are the those are the clear things that are taught in Scripture. You know, how we take that information and and look at you know somebody else and, and wonder, well, I mean, that that's a human thing to do. I understand that, but ultimately, we we can't use those ideas to determine for someone else, you know, what, what's really going on there. So I, I think we, we need to, you know, you, 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 we all know people like that. You know, we need to talk to them and be honest with them about their sin. We need to, to challenge them to think about what, what's really going on inside. You know, do you, are, are you really believing the gospel or not? I don't really care that, that you, you know, you, you prayed a prayer 10 years ago, and now you, you, you've basically taken that and said, well, I said the incantation, I can do whatever I want now. I question that. I question the validity, the validity of your faith, because you know you've you've given me no choice. You know, I I wonder because you've given me reason to wonder, but I can't decide for you. I I can't tell. I don't know, but you need to examine yourself. Isn't that a scriptural phrase? Let a man examine himself. Okay, I'm not going to examine you. I'm going to tell you that from what I see, I it, it prompts a concern, but that's about all I can do. I can just tell you I'm concerned. I can't produce the answer for you. Only you can do that. So we need to encourage people, you know, to examine themselves. That's what that's what the, the New Testament does in, in you know number any number of places. And I think we ought to stick to that and not try to position ourselves as some sort of wise spiritual authority able to see behind the veil and, and you know, penetrate a person's mind and really know you know, what, what's going on in there, but we can get the person, you know, hopefully to consider themselves and then talk to them about the gospel. The answer is always the same, whether they were a believer, you know, and now they're just, you know, stuck in sin or whether they didn't believe at all. The answer is still the same. Do you believe this right now? Do you believe the gospel right now? I don't need a scorecard. I don't need a box score. Okay. I don't need to be omniscient. It doesn't matter. What, what matters is right now. You know, you need you need to make this this right. You need to make this decision, whatever. But let, let's go on to another question. I don't want to be too sermonic here. 
All right, Jim from Mississippi, and actually a few others like Stephen have asked about Matthew 7. So I'm going to read Jim's from Mississippi okay. question. Throughout the series, Mike has frequently identified the passages where the writer of Hebrews stresses the importance of belief in Jesus. Yet it seems the folks to whom Jesus refers in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, thought that they believed in Jesus. Yet he says he never knew them and he cast them out because they did not do the will of his father. In my own attempts to reconcile these passages, I find that the same word justified appears in James 2.24, quote, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, end quote, as well in Romans 3.28, quote, but they are justified freely by his grace throughout the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, end quote. So maybe the folks in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, either did not believe or they didn't believe the right stuff. I think I'm in the red zone. Can Mike help me get this across <laughs> the goal line? I only <laughs> hope he said that because you won fantasy. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. That's, I love that's the football nice, references. Yeah. Right. It's a nice uh, turn of a phrase there. Uh, I think the key here is verse 23. This is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Verse 23, Jesus calls these people, quote, workers of lawlessness. I would say that Jesus is targeting pretenders here. They had a profession, you know, Lord, Lord, you know, I mean, this profession of of their allegiance to him. But their lives showed they did not really believe they were workers of lawlessness. Now, if that isn't the way to take that passage, then we'd have to affirm that Jesus called genuine believers workers of lawlessness. I think that's a stretch to say the least. Another way, another way of looking at this, you know, let's ask who is Jesus exposing? Okay, again, who's he, who's he targeting here? Is he targeting disciples or believers whose behavior was imperfect? Is he targeting disciples or believers who struggle with sin? Is he targeting disciples or believers who have times of weakness? Well, guess what? All three of those things describes the 11 disciples who weren't Judas. They all got scared. They all forsook Christ. They bickered with each other. They debated their own self-importance. Would Jesus really call those guys workers of lawlessness? I don't think so. I think, again, he's targeting pretenders. You know, Where do we get the idea? I mean, honestly, sometimes we, we, we sort of subconsciously have this idea that the apostles and Paul were perfect. You know, and this becomes part of this works you know, problem, this discussion. They faltered. They faltered. Disciples forsook Jesus. I mean, how, how bad can it get? They struggled with sin. You know, Paul, Romans 7, okay? It, you know, and like it, you know, lo, people you know, love to try to argue Paul, you know, out of that passage that he wasn't really a believer struggling with sin. Well, frankly, I think they do that because they somehow assume that Paul, you know, was some like sort of peon or perfection. Again, Paul is human. He's as human as anybody else. Now, he, he might sin less, okay, but his sin will probably bother him more. Again, you, you, could, you could look at things like that, but he's struggling. Okay, he's struggling. There's no reason to think that he didn't struggle. Okay, he's not glorified. He's Paul. He's a human being. Again, that list, struggling with sin, behavior's not perfect. They chicken out. They, they're weak. Those are the 11 disciples. So I, I don't think Paul, Jesus would look at those 11 guys and say, you guys are workers of lawlessness. Just don't believe that. So I, I think what Jesus is targeting, again, is, is pretenders. And again, we have to remember, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Everyone is going to sin. Everyone's going to struggle. Everyone's going to fail. So if Jesus is shooting you know, at all those people who, who struggle and fail. And well, I guess he doesn't have any disciples there. I guess nobody's a believer. You know, it, again, you have, to, you have to think about the ramifications of, of you know, where these, where these different conclusions lead. You know, everyone fails. I mean, just, you know, who, who, would, who would Jesus have as a disciple? Again, I don't think he's, he's targeting believers who are struggling here or, or who fail. I think he's targeting pretenders. They're not, they're not really believers. They might think they are, but they're not. And that takes us to James. You know, and this whole, you know, faith and works, you know, 
show me a man's, you know, faith and not, you know, show me his works and then I'll, I'll consider his faith real. All this kind of talk. Again, that, that, that James uses, James 2.24 was quoted in the question, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, okay? Well, what we mean by that, what James means by that, I don't think is terribly complicated. I think it gets complicated because we have been browbeaten into a merit mentality. We think we have to merit God's love. If we believe that, if we swallow that pill, then we, we create these conundra. Works, according to James, justify faith. In, and what that means is they validate faith. Works don't replace faith in anything James says, ever. He doesn't replace faith with works. Works show faith is real. Works serve to point to genuine faith. Faith is the thing that we need to find out if it's real. Real faith is shown by works. Again, the problem is thinking of works like they can be interchanged with faith or that they replace faith. Works are not a substitute for faith in the book of James. He never says that. Uh, I, I like to think of, I like to marry Ephesians 2 8 to James. For by grace you are saved through faith, without works is dead. You know, smash the verses together. And it, I think it, it, to me it's helpful anyway. Maybe it's not helpful at all. But if, if you think about that, you know, for grace are you saved through faith, without works is dead. The absence of works doesn't say, oh, crud, I just didn't work hard enough to merit eternal life. No. The absence of works says, faith isn't here. Works are not a substitute for faith. Faith cannot be exchanged for works. Works show that faith is in the building. Now, let's, let's, uh, this isn't a syllogism, but to try, to try to illustrate this, I've, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this. And let, let, let's try to do it this way. Let, let's try to illustrate it this way. Let's try to, to swap in some other terms. So let, let's start with works and faith. So works or actions, maybe, if, if that helps you. Works don't produce faith. Works don't replace faith. Works validate or demonstrate faith. In other words, works shows us that faith is there. Works are necessary to show that faith is real. Their absence invalidates a claim of faith. Now, he's really talking about basically a total absence here. You know, remember, James says faith without works is dead. He doesn't say faith with you know, 60% works. Is, you know, he says faith without works is dead. So he's really talking about the situation where there's basically a total absence. But we have to fix in our minds, works don't produce faith. They don't replace faith. They validate or demonstrate faith. Now, let's, let's use some other vocabulary and see if, if this doesn't help. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I have three sets of these. Let's use the, the, the phrase kind gestures and love. Kind gestures don't produce love. Okay, just, just think about the, the, the truth of these statements. Kind gestures don't produce love. Kind gestures don't replace love. But kind gestures validate love. In other words, kind gestures are necessary to show that love is real. Their absence would invalidate a claim of love, wouldn't they? Let's try obedience and loyalty. Obedience doesn't produce loyalty. Obedience doesn't replace loyalty. But obedience validates loyalty. In other words, obedience is necessary to show that loyalty is real. Its absence would invalidate any claim of loyalty. To be a little more philosophical here, let's try effects and causes. Effects don't produce causes. Effects don't replace causes. Effects validate causes, though. In other words, effects necessarily require a cause. If there's no effect, there's no need to look for a cause. Now, I don't know if any of that helps, but I think if, you, if we start substituting other words, because we have this works and faith thing that creates a lot of confusion. My advice is always to people, focus on merit and discipleship. Merit and discipleship. When, as soon as you start using the word merit, it, it sort of cleans out the room a little bit, in some cases a lot. You know, when, when someone is talking about, you know, works being, you know, you, you know that, that's got to be part of salvation. Oh, so, so you're talking, you're, you're, what you're really saying is that we merit eternal life in some way. Anybody who really understands the gospel is going to be caught short by that and go, well, boy, I, 
I sure don't want to say it that way because then it sounds like God owes us something. Yeah, you're right, it does. But that's actually where you're at theologically. If your behavior is a necessary ingredient, uh, ingredient to salvation itself, okay, then that's merit. That's merit. That's what that is. Okay, there is no merit before God. God doesn't want it. He doesn't expect it, and he doesn't need it. And he knows he ain't getting it, <laughs> okay? He's just not. That's why we have Jesus, okay? That's why Jesus is the one who sets us apart and sanctifies us and so on and so forth. So merit, I think, can clear the room in a lot of ways. When we talk about sanctification, things like let, let's let's use the word discipleship. And hopefully, we know enough about discipleship where we realize that that involves imitating Jesus. It doesn't have, have, have anything to do with merit, but it has everything to do with, with trying to, to mimic the experience, the life of Jesus, you know, again, as, as a follower of him, not trying to earn salvation, but just trying to follow him, trying to, trying to imitate his life. You know, the, the real question again, I've said this before, is, is why should we live a holy life? Shall we sin so that grace may abound? You know, I want all the grace God has to give me, so I'm going to keep on sinning to experience that grace. I mean, this is this is a New Testament problem. You know, Paul says in Romans 6, to God forbid. You know, and he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Died to sin is Paul's expression for quote, you know, chose to follow Christ. How can we who have chosen to follow Christ instead of living for our own passions think this? And when we believed, when we chose to, you know, Christ, we were united to his body. You know, the body that died and the one that rose again. So the Christian life is the prop, the process of mimicking Jesus dying to yourself, not putting yourself above showing gratitude to God as a son or daughter in his household. And of course, treating your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus did. Okay, being conformed to his image now that you believe. That, that, that's discipleship. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, we're supposed to be dying with Jesus. Again, preferring others over ourselves and living out living according to, to what God wants us to do. We need to try to imitate that, not to earn the status of sonship or daughtership. Jesus was already God's son. He's, he's doing this. He, he learns obedience by weakness. You know, all this stuff in Hebrews that we've talked about. Okay, we need to imitate that, not so that we merit God's love. God loved us before this was even an issue. He loved us before he even sent Jesus. And our, our behavior isn't what sparks a feeling of love in God's heart for us that's already there. But in terms of discipleship, we try to imitate Jesus. We die to ourselves. We prefer others over ourselves. We prefer, you know, what God wants us to do over our own, you know, desires. And this is what we try to do. And you know what? If we do that, it's going to produce suffering. There's going to be a consequence to it, just like it was for Jesus. Now, in his case, he became obedient unto death. But guess what? He rose, so we should walk, because we're united to his resurrection body, too. We're not just united to the one that's going to die. We're united to the one that rose, and so we should live, we should walk as though we're raised from the dead, meaning we're freed from the dominion of the curse of sin. We're freed from the penalty of sin. The point is imitation, not trying to merit God's love. Again, he already loved you while you were yet a sinner, before you ever had any thought about any of this. Your behavior doesn't spark that inside God. It's been there the whole time. So discipleship is to be like Jesus, not so that God will say to himself, gosh, he or she is so good. I want them up here with me. No, no. Be like Jesus because he did what was necessary to have you up there with him. You serve out of a grateful heart. If you do, God will reward that by using you like he'd love to use you to further his own purposes. So discipleship is about experiencing in your own body what it was like to be Jesus. That includes suffering and struggle. It doesn't mean, you know, doing whatever the heck you want, knowing that God loves you anyway, 
Again, we are to imitate Jesus' love for the Father, which was reflected by the way he lived, and then take the consequences, just like Jesus did, knowing that a more abundant life is waiting for you on the other side. Jesus knew that. You know, no doubt Jesus enjoyed being human, but it came with a huge cost. His life was never about pleasing himself. Rather, he, you know, just like Paul says in Philippians, he took upon the form of a servant and he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even to the point of death. Okay, so discipleship, this thing we call sanctification, isn't, you know, filling out checklists, isn't doing things so that God looks at us and says, gosh, they're good. I want them up here. They've earned it. No, discipleship is about experiencing in your own body what it was like to be Jesus. We live for God. We live for others. It, it, it's servanthood. I mean, there's, there's any number of ways you can express it. There, there are lots of reasons. Again, these are, these are the big ones, you know, to, to live a certain way. But meriting favor with God, trying to, to spark some love inside God for yourself, is not one of those reasons. Just isn't. All right, Mike, well, we're going to stop it right there and save the rest of the questions for part two. But can I just say what great questions we get from such a great audience? I mean, very thoughtful. Uh, yeah, th these are not lightweight questions. Absolutely not. And to be able to articulate it in such a uh, uh, concise, articulated manner is hard to do because usually these questions are, you know, I know you guys, y'all send me in your questions and they're a couple of paragraphs long, I do include everything for Mike so he understands the context of your question, but then I kind of condense it down to ask the actual question for the sake of the podcast. But uh, nonetheless, please know that he does see the entire context of your questions. And uh, uh, it's hard to ask some of these questions because there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have to be unpacked for sure. Like I said, they're not, they're not lightweight questions. Absolutely. All right, Mike. Well, we appreciate uh, everybody sending in their questions. We appreciate Mike uh, answering those questions. And next week, uh, we'll have part two. Uh, and with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.